Good evening. Uh, we're going to be in Acts chapter 18, verses 1 through 17. It's going to take a, a few minutes to get there. Um, but tonight, I, I want to preach a, a simple message. Um, there were likely a couple of different biblical routes I, I maybe could have taken with tonight's passage, but I'd like to tell you up front I'm going to be taking the main road on this one um, because it stepped on my toes. Uh, it convicted me and encouraged me, and, and as I prepared for this uh, sermon, it just became greater, more, more, more greater and greater impressed upon my heart. And my prayer leading up to tonight has been that the Lord would do the same for you as we open his word and, and examine it together and examine our hearts together. Uh, as Pastor said just a couple of months ago, in uh, early November, Allison and I were graciously afforded the opportunity to go to Greece and, uh, and Turkey uh, by way of cruising the coastline of the Aegean Sea. Uh, we were able to see some of the most spectacular uh, examples of God's handiwork in nature and uh, just more incredible things than I've ever been able to see before. And uh, we were able to see several of the places Paul visited on his missionary journeys. Now, this wasn't a, uh, a, a, a biblically-themed cruise. Um, it, it, was, it was secular, but we were in the areas um, where Paul was on his, mission, on his missionary journeys, and so uh, we took the time to really soak that in and, and uh, enjoy that. Um, we were given a really great glimpse into the ancient uh, biblical world of what life would have looked like uh, in the time of Paul writing his letters to the church at Corinth, uh, the church at Thessaloniki, and the church at Ephesus. And uh, we were able, able to experience several other places in Scripture, such as Athens and the islands of uh, Rhodes or Rhodos, and uh, Crete. Um, so I'll start first by doing a little bit of show and tell. Uh, so if we can get that first slide rolling. So here, uh, it's a really interesting uh, Corinth, ancient Corinth, is kind of in the middle of a village or, or what would be the equivalent of our suburb. And so uh, I'm looking down through here now, and, and, the, and the reason it's so uh, uh, lower than everything else above it is because obviously uh, Corinth was destroyed a few times and uh, it was just backfilled and built on top of. And so uh, through the means of earthquakes, they've been able to uncover ancient Corinth. And so right here, you're actually looking at uh, one of the main roads leading into Corinth. Um, this, this little strip right here of plain stark white, that's the Lycaean Road uh, going into Corinth. Uh, it's the road Paul would have definitely been on. And, uh, and it's, it's just really interesting to see such a place so old and so rich in history just in the middle of, of houses, like people's backyards. Um, it, it was really incredible. So we'll go ahead and move on to the next one. And uh, this is the Temple of Apollo in, uh, in Corinth. It originally had, I believe, 38 columns. Um, they've only been able to, to resurrect seven. Um, and uh, just, uh, we'll get a better glimpse of it here in a second, but on the top of that mountain there, on the very uh, left-hand side of the screen, there's the Acro Corinth, which is, uh, essentially the Acropolis. It's, it's where people would have gone in, in times of, of war. If the enemy was coming in, uh, they would have retreated there, and there would have been food and water for them. Um, the picture doesn't do it justice. That was quite a trek from where we were standing down there, but uh, we'll go ahead and forward the next one. Uh, this is great. Um, you'll find several statues like this, um, and, and, the, and the reasons why they don't have heads uh, is because Essentially, as, as the Romans came in and, and took over everything, you know, emperors were kind of like, sometimes they would, they would switch by like day and night, it would seem. And so what would happen is you'd have faithful followers, you'd have insurrectionists. And so if there was an emperor who went under, who got killed, what have you, uh, they would, there would be riots in the street and they would just tear down all the statues and break them apart. And so uh, they finally wised up their their artists in the public works sector finally wised up. And uh, they said, hey, we'll just make these kind of plain, ambiguous bodies, and we'll just make holes in the neck, and, and we'll just put heads there when we get a new emperor so everybody doesn't have to tear them down. So uh, a lot of the times in antiquity, you'll find, like, big bodies and little heads and vice versa, and it's because that wasn't made for that. It was almost like a, a custom fit to a degree. Um, but really interesting, and they said archaeologists get really excited when they find a head and a body together. So uh, we'll go on to the next one. And then 
So uh, this is looking back. I'm actually standing in the forum of Corinth right here looking back. That archway uh, wasn't originally standing. It didn't survive all the years standing. But what they've done and kind of their standard for archaeology and, and putting things back together, they, they're putting everything back together to kind of give people a vision of how life was, especially um, in Ephesus. Ephesus was uh, spectacular. Uh, so much more to Ephesus than Corinth at this point. Um, but the, their standards for doing so is that the, uh, the recreations, right, the, the, the pieces that they're using to put things kind of back where they were, they have to be clearly like modern day materials like concrete and things like that. You have to easily be able to uh, decipher what's original and what's not. So um, you can maybe kind of see some of the lighter, lighter uh, or darker actually uh, blocks in that arch are actually concrete. Um, and different materials like that. And again, that's the Temple of Apollo in the background. Uh, go ahead to the next one for me. And uh, so this is the forum. It looks like empty dead space, but this is where people would gather and talk politics, talk religion, talk what have you. Uh, several big trees in the area that I somehow managed to not capture uh, in this photo, but uh, just a very big wide open space. And this is actually where I just took the previous picture from, from this angle. And so we're really gonna come and rest uh, right here uh, where these people are on the, on the right-hand side, uh, if we can advance that. Here, uh, the Bema seat, the judgment seat. And uh, all, one of my favorite features of this photo is the, the dog who's just had way too much, and he's laying on his side in front of the Bema seat. Uh, they, have, uh, they have, like, village dogs. Like, the dogs know where their homes are, but they all just roam, and everybody takes care of them, so they're all really fat, well-fed. And uh, they're just loved on by everybody. Same thing for cats. Um, but uh, yeah, what kind of in the area where those people were standing is, is, is this, and it's the Bema seat. And you can kind of get a picture of the, the acro corinth there in the background. You see kind of the stark, uh, jagged edges up there on the top. Um, and this is, this is where Paul was as we find ourselves uh, here in Acts chapter 18, verses 1 through 17. And so. This is where we're going to focus tonight and explore the context of Scripture and, and explore in the context of Scripture where Corinth was at this time. And, and particularly, we're going to look at the Bema Seat of Judgment where Paul was put on trial by the Jews in Corinth. Uh, and we'll eventually get there, but I, I want us to know a little more brief context and background on Corinth itself uh, so we can better understand Paul's uh, evangelism, Paul's mission there, uh, and, and what led to him being placed before this this be my seat. So Corinth was a, a major city in the Roman Empire, and it was at an important crossroads of trade and travel. And because of this, Paul knew that people from all over the world were, were passing through it. And so he knew that a strong church there could touch lives in all parts of the world. And, and he knew Corinth was a tough city. It already had a, a great reputation uh, by the time he got there. And uh, he wasn't interested in just planting churches where uh, he thought it was easy. We know that from Scripture, and I'm thankful for that. Um, but also because of this coming and going of so many different kinds of people from all over the world, the city was also a catch-all for money, for vice, a petri dish for the growth of the strange and the unusual in terms of uh, philosophies and false new religions. All things bizarre and blasphemous kind of converged here in Corinth. It was a city of excess and a city that was exceedingly confused. And Corinth had a, a remarkable reputation for sin as well, especially sexual immorality. It was well known throughout the entire Roman Empire. In fact, to act like a Corinthian meant that you actually pursued fornication, and to be called a Corinthian girl was to actually be synonymous with a prostitute. Um, so those were just terms that were even used in the day uh, in the context of, of Corinth and what it was. And so here in cha uh, Acts chapter 18, we find Paul at the end of his uh, second missionary journey in the beginning of the third. And uh, my first point here might be a little misleading because it bleeds into my second, and I give some better context and clarity on it, so just bear with me. But this first point as we move forward kind of bleeds through the whole of, of what I'm going to say tonight. And so we'll start here in verse 1. After these things... Paul departed from Athens and came to Corinth and found a certain Jew named Aquila, born in Pontius, lately come from Italy with his wife Priscilla, because that Claudius had commanded all Jews to depart from Rome. 
and came unto them. And because he was of the same craft, he abode with them and wrought, for by their occupation they were tent makers. And so here, when Paul came to Corinth, there were, like I said, all, all these different kinds of philosophies and teachers and, and false teachers floating around, uh, preying upon the ignorance and the superstition that existed within the population there. They were essentially leeching off the people, right? Uh, drawing funds from them to support their lifestyles, to support their half-truths and their whole lies. Not much different than we can see in some kind of mainstream things today digitally. We see a lot of charlatans making livings off their followers, right? And so one of the ways Paul kind of led by example and differentiated himself from these, uh, these false religious teachers was to support himself. Um, he didn't ask for support, for financial support for his ministry. Uh, instead, he worked for his living. And he did this so as to not impose uh, on people and make Christ a burden on anyone. And, and this would have been particularly important for the Corinthian people to observe. Uh, Paul could have, as he ministered and led people to Christ, asked them to financially support his ministry, but he chose a different path. And that's not to say that we shouldn't financially support uh, evangelists. I'm not saying that this is a prescriptive approach. Paul clearly encourages the financial support of evangelists and pastors in his other epistles, but for this time in this city and for his ministry, Paul discerned this was the best approach. So it could be because of this, I, I don't know, that the Lord gifted Paul with devoted helpers in the husband and wife team of Aquila and Priscilla. They were tent makers. They were believers in Christ, too. Uh, and the three helped each other in the day-to-day -day work of making a living. They labored together for Christ as well. And we know from Paul's own writings in Romans that that just after our text tonight in Acts, they, they risked their lives for Paul, and they worked with him on the mission field in Ephesus, and they were faithful, dear family in, in Christ. And so as we move into verse 4, this is kind of our backing for this, we understand that Paul, it says, and he, Paul, reasoned in the synagogue every Sabbath and persuaded the Jews and the Greeks. You know, I love that scripture depicts Paul as leveling the truth of Christ against the philosophies of false religion is reasonable. We live in a time where uh, the world will tell us that what we believe, that, that the truth of Christianity, the truth of the gospel, is, is unreasonable. It's crazy. But Paul here is doing the exact opposite. He is reasoning with these people in their lostness, in their falsehood, with the truth of the gospel. And as, the more I study scripture, right, I've been saved for a while, but the more I study scripture, the more I am convinced of the truth of, of God's word, that, that it continually grows on me, and it is the best explanation for our reality. It absolutely is. So I love that scripture depicts Paul as leveling the truth against these philosophies of false religion as reasonable. And notice, too, the consistency here as well. Paul was there, what does it say, every Sabbath to reason and persuade the people into faith in Christ. So what was the result of Paul's consistency? Jews and Gentiles alike were persuaded. The Greek here actually says they were affectionately persuaded to the truth of the gospel and inherited saving faith in Christ. So this means that Paul's giving of the gospel was noticed among these these religious, stern, live-or-die-by-the-rules Jews as having a sincere and supernatural tenderness, concern, and love for people. It persuaded them. And when in verse 5, we find that Silas and Timotheus come as well. It says, And when Silas and Timotheus were come from Macedonia, Paul was pressed in the Spirit and testified to the Jews that Jesus was Christ. So here we have God bringing in more faithful friends to Paul and Silas and Timothy. And this just impressed upon my heart how much we as a church body need each other. We need to be physically present with each other, to hold each other accountable, to convict each other if needed, to edify one another and encourage, spurring one another on to good works in Christ. Scripture does not pinpoint an exact reason as to why Paul was pressed in his spirit, but I wholeheartedly believe that the spiritual nourishment he received from the ministry of his faithful friends here was part of that. 
No one disputes that Paul was an incredible evangelist. And arguably, he's probably the best evangelist who ever lived. But how much could he have accomplished on his own? This is a lesson for us as the body of Christ to pull together, to be present for one another for the sake of the gospel. We need this. If the last two years have taught us anything, one of the main lessons should be that we need each other. Can we put aside our personal preferences, our complaints about church, this church member's attitude or that church member's attitude, quirks? Can we put aside the seeds of bitterness that we let creep in and we often a few refuse to address and we let them fester into sin? Can we put away pettiness? I worry that sometimes we fail to realize we're a family. A family of devoted helpers that is supposed to build one another up in spite of what we would prefer for ourselves, in spite of how we often even feel about each other. Because in spite of all of those differences and our, com our common bond is the shed blood of Christ. And that should come over every difference that we have so that we can resolve things in a manner that is biblical and pleasing to the Lord. Why? So we can build each other up and spur each other on to good works in Christ for the sake of building his church. And this presence of friends and the faith helped encourage Paul and his spirit to push forward, testifying to the Jews that Jesus was the Christ. And then we find ourselves in verse 6. And when they opposed themselves and blasphemed, he shook his raiment and said unto them, your blood be upon your own heads. I am clean. From henceforth, I will go unto the Gentiles. Paul had a keen awareness of his, ability to first, of, his, of his responsibility to first bring the truth of the gospel to the Jews, but when his message was rejected, he wasted no time in turning right around and going to the Gentiles. Paul was actually here fulfilling the spirit of what Christ says in Matthew 7, 6, which says, Give not that which is holy unto the dogs, Neither cast ye your pearls before swine, lest they trample them under their feet and turn again to rend you. So Paul here dramatically shakes his garments because he didn't want even a speck of the foolishness, of the blasphemy that resided in the synagogue left on his clothes. It was foul to him. It was ultimately him saying, I reject your rejection of the gospel. And notice here that the Jews Paul was reasoning with, they, they didn't just reject the, the soundness of the truth of the gospel. They blasphemed it. They blasphemed it. They, they set themselves against it. They put on battle armor to fight it. It wasn't good enough to say, not for me, go your own way. They were essentially saying, I don't believe this, and I find this so offensive and gross that I'm going to stop at nothing to keep other people from believing it. That's a little scary, right? That people could have that posture towards us, the gospel. It's not shocking to us, but it is scary if we think about it. And if we're being honest, I think fear is likely what holds many of us back. Maybe we're afraid to come face to face with some spiritual dogs or swine and take their rejection and their blasphemy. Maybe sometimes we're afraid to take that head on. And I would venture to say that many of us probably give place to some of that in our own evangelism. You know, the teens and I, uh, the first part of our all-nighter that we did just uh, like a week and a half ago now, seems like it was just yesterday, but we met here at the church at 8, and um, we did the most passive form of evangelism we possibly could. We got here, we got here at 8, and around 8.20, I was like, I didn't tell them what we were doing. I was like, here's what we're going to do. Gave everybody a bunch of tracks. We went down to Clay Terrace, and I'm like, hit and run with the gospel. You don't even have to talk to anybody. Just hear Happy New Year. Boom. Just get the truth of the gospel in their hands, right? Just like a hit and run, 20 minutes in and out, cover the whole place, we're done. You would be astounded at the rejection we faced and people just not even wanting to take 
a simple tract. As a matter of fact, when we kind of congregated back together, I was like, who, who, what, what, we divided up into teams, and I was kind of getting a report, and I was like, who faced rejection? Every team faced rejection to one degree or another. And I said, good. That's good, because that's part of it. I have this, I have, sometimes I have really deep, profound sayings that I come up with with the teens, and uh, one thing I've told them, and I do mean that in jest, just so you know, <laughs> Uh, but one thing I've told them is that uh, rejection is a merit badge we all wear on the sash of life. That's a Pastor Perry original. <laughs> Copyright, TM. <laughs> uh, but it's, it's true. We will all face rejection, uh, particularly in evangelism. And why? Because the gospel isn't comfortable. It doesn't sit well with our world, but it is indeed the truth. And if our eyes have been opened to the glorious truth of who Christ is, and we've been miraculously saved by his gospel, and God has given us faith to believe in it, how can we not share it in spite of whatever fear we might have? How can we not? Paul did. Paul was afraid too. And the Lord addresses it here in verses 7 through 11. In verse 7 it says, And he departed thence, and entered into a certain man's house named Justice, one that worshipped God, whose house was joined hard to the synagogue. And Crispus, the chief ruler of the synagogue, believed on the Lord with all his house, and many of the Corinthians, hearing, believed, and were baptized. So, so Crispus, the chief ruler of the synagogue, believes on the Lord as well as his whole house, which might seem a little odd to us as we just go back a couple of verses and we realize what happened in the synagogue. Paul literally shook his clothing at them, his rejection of their rejection of the gospel. But then we see this. And this shows the manner in which Paul treated the Jews in Corinth with love and with grace, even after they rejected him in the gospel. But there's a, another glorious working of Christ here. If the chief ruler of the synagogue converted to Christianity then all the other rank-and-file Jews under him would be left without excuse for their blasphemy. The eminent leader of the synagogue, the most learned among them, the most religious among them, should be the most strict and practiced among them. If he comes to saving knowledge in Christ, where does everybody else stand? And it's not just him. It was his whole house. And so Crispus's conversion here would have, had, would have opened many opportunities for Paul to evangelize. And we see the result of this in verse 8. That says, many of the Corinthians hearing the gospel believed. But, but with these gospel-giving opportunities also came other opportunities. More opportunities for hardship, for the enemy to work, and, in, and, and danger to be infused into the situation. Because after all, do we really expect blasphemers to just stand idly by, to concede quietly, to fall in line. No, the dangers and the pressures were mounting up against Paul. And he was making great strides for the kingdom, but Satan was also on the prowl, doing his best work against Paul in the hearts and minds of wicked men who suppressed the truth and unrighteousness. Verse 9 says, Then spake the Lord to Paul in the night by a vision, Be not afraid, but speak. Hold not thy peace, for I am with thee, and no man shall set on thee to hurt thee, for I have much people in this city. And he continued there a year and six months, teaching the word of God among them. Knowing what we know about Corinth, it would likely be the last place God would have here, as verse 10 states, much people residing with it, as, as we would think of it. It would be like looking at Las Vegas today, a city that is so uh, enraptured by sin that it's adopted it as its tagline of sin city. It'd be like looking at, at Las Vegas and saying God has much people within that city. And trust me, I was there back in May. It did not feel that way. As a matter of fact, uh, there was a moment that Allison and I had where we were just kind of walking around you know, through some stores and stuff, and we were kind of coming down this escalator that was uh, going across a busy road. They have a lot of pedestrian 
places to cross over busy roads. And so we were coming down this escalator. There was this great commotion. And, you know, with my heightened sense of awareness, I turn around, danger, you know. And uh, there's, there's this woman, and she's running down the escalator, the, the, the wrong escalator, and uh, losing, losing time on that, actually, and her speed. And there, I just, there's a police officer running behind her, and he's yelling at her to stop running. That's what he's saying. Stop running. And she is full force down these escalators with a purse in her hand. And she goes, I'm not running. Right? Well, long story short, she had stolen a purse from a really expensive store. And, man, he, she got off the escalator, and, and she, was, she was going, and he caught up with her, and he just leveled her out right there. It was awesome. <laughs> it was so cool. But God says here he has much people in a city like that, in Corinth. And when it comes to our God and his word, he's never wrong, never mistaken or unclear in his perception. But Paul was clearly in need of encouragement here, or else the Lord wouldn't have offered it. He wouldn't have given it. And spiritually, Paul, think about it, he was a fish out of water in Corinth. It wasn't comfortable. The moral corruption of Corinth was so foul and so odious that it was making him probably fearful, somewhat even depressed, because the Lord needed to speak to his heart. And that makes me pause and wonder, what places might God be calling us to that we fear to go? Where might we not want to go because it's familiar? We might, we might have too much working knowledge of the place and its shortcomings and its sin. What places would we shy away from because they are undesirable? We may be tempted to think, Lord, how, how could you have much people there? It's, it's a den of thieves and a den of liars and of lewdness, fornication, and blasphemy. But church, those are the very places that Christ calls us to take the transformative power of his gospel. Are we doing it? Are we doing it? You know, it's, it's great to have an event like Trunk or Treat. And we had such a great response from our church body that, that we had more help than we actually needed. And that was a huge, huge blessing. And I stood up here when we had our pre-meeting and I said, hey, even if you're not actively in here giving the gospel, if you're just running a trunk or whatever, you're facilitating that. It's, it's that important, and we need the help. And you guys showed up, and it was awesome. We had 500, I don't know if we ever gave the exact number, but we had 520 roundabout people show up. And they were exposed to the gospel in, I think, three different ways. And then, I don't know if you guys know this, but we were able to reach out to them through email and invite them to our Christmas program. I don't know how much fruit we actually saw from that, but we did it. But here's my concern. When the candy was all passed out, when the sun went down and we got in our cars and we went home, and in the quiet of our own houses and in our own hearts, did we hang up our evangelism hats for the year? Did we? Did we check off a box and we did something evangelistic for the Lord and, and we're done? Because that's not the example that's set here for us. The thrust of New Testament scripture, Christ's life, his ministry, his death, his resurrection, and the core of Paul's example here is that we go. That we go. And maybe we go where it's familiar, where we open our doors and people from our community come and they flood our church and we evangelize them and they meet us on our own turf. That's wonderful. Praise the Lord for that. But there's an element of going here that cannot be denied. And that's going to the undesirable, uncomfortable places where people are dying and going to hell without the truth. And so what is the result of going? Go with me to verse 11. And he continued there a year and six months teaching the word of God among them. Paul had longevity in Corinth. A place he likely would have least expected in fact, in those 18 months in Corinth, we find Paul having great success. And the Lord proves his promise of having much people in Corinth. 
here in 1 Corinthians verses, uh, uh, chapter 1, verses 26 through 31. It, you don't have to turn there. I'll read it for you, but if you want to, you can. 1 Corinthians 1, 26 through 31. Verse 26, For ye, seeing your calling, brethren, how that not many wise men after the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called, but God who hath chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise, and God hath chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty, and the base of things of the world, and the things which are despised, hath God chosen, yea, and things which are not bring to naught things that are, that no flesh should glory in his presence, but of him are ye in Christ Jesus, who of God is made unto us wisdom and righteousness and sanctification and redemption, that... As according, to, as according as it is written, he that glorieth, let him glory in the Lord. Verse 26 here tells us that the church in Corinth was not made up of many wise and noble people. Those, those with power, those on the upper crust of society. It was made up of sinners whose lives were transformed by the grace of God. Sinners who, if we were to put this in the modern context of my Las Vegas example, had been out stealing purses, were drunk and drugged and laying in their own vomit on the sidewalk, were hardly dressed, tempting others to sin. The church was made up of these kinds of people who were miraculously saved and transformed by the grace of God. And God was using them to confound those who were rich in worldly wisdom. That is the result of going and spreading the gospel. And guys, can I just be honest with you? I will, I will be brutally honest with you. One of, those, one of those moments where you're like, Pastor, you shouldn't say that kind of, kind of moments. And it's going to be about me, so don't worry about it. But I feel like I do a horrible job every time I give the gospel. I've been in the church my whole life. I got saved at an early age. I know the gospel. But it seems like, whether it's my flesh or, or the enemy or, or what have you, it seems like every time I give the gospel, I just come back and I'm like, I blew it. I did not do a good job. It was too choppy. Uh, the person I was talking to was interrupting me. I lost my train of thought. Any number of things that, that again, my flesh or the enemy would kind of bring up to discourage me in that, I'll think of it. And as a matter of fact, Last, the second to last time I gave the gospel to somebody, I came home and I cried because I felt like I let the Lord down. I felt like I had just let him down, that I did not do a good enough job. But the Lord can work in spite of my imperfections. And he does work in spite of my imperfections. Because that same person with whom I thought I botched the gospel has since come back to me with questions about Jesus, about the church, about versions of the Bible. They're lost, but they're searching. And it's, it's not to toot my own horn, it's just to share with you, it's not my job to change the hearts of men. I can't do it. You can't do it. That's only something that God can do. It's his doing and his doing alone. But I am called to go and to spread the good news of the gospel, even if I'm not the best at it. As the Lord says to Paul in verse 9, be not afraid, but speak, and hold not thy peace. Do not be silent. Why? Verse 10, for I am with thee. For I am with thee. So, where is uncomfortable for you? For me, it's an uncle who's an ardent atheist, militaristic in his belief, who has poured out just bitterness on my mom, his sister, all the years, that, and my dad too, that they've had us in church and, and raised, us, raised us in church, has made fun of us, has come to family functions, and just obliterated us, right? A lot of those backhanded comments and things like that. That's a place that I'm afraid to go. But my calling is not to change his heart, because I cannot do that. My calling is to give him the truth of the gospel, whether he accepts it or not. And I must make sure that he knows the truth and has been presented with it. And here's the, the greatest thing about this. Through it all, the fear 
the awkwardness of human interaction and relationships and conversation, the resistance that we meet, the Lord goes with me. And he doesn't go to look over my shoulder and to make sure I did it just right, to make sure I said all the right things. He goes with me to help me. Spurgeon considered uh, the promise of Jesus here, saying, for I am with you, is this. He thought it emphasized three things. The presence of Jesus, the sympathy of Jesus, and the cooperation of Jesus in our evangelism. And so we see this promise following all of this that God makes to Paul about going with him and keeping him safe from harm come to fruition in, in these next few verses. Go with me to verse 12. And when Gallio was the deputy of Achaia, the Jews made insurrection with one accord against Paul and brought him to the judgment seat, saying, This fellow persuadeth men to worship God contrary to the law. And when Paul was now about to open his mouth, Gallio said unto the Jews, If it were a matter of wrong or wicked lewdness, O ye Jews, reason, that I would, uh, reason would that I should bear with you. But if it be a question of words and names and your law, look ye to it. For I will be no judge of such matters. And he drave them from the judgment seat. And then all the Greeks took Sosthenes, the chief ruler of the synagogue, and beat him before the judgment seat. And Gallio cared for none of those things. There's only one example of divine protection during Paul's ministry here in Corinth, and this is it. The Bema seat. And I'm, I'm actually going to start wrapping this up, but I don't want you to miss how incredible this moment actually is. The same Jews who blasphemed Christ in the synagogue were so pitted against Paul at this point that they hoped the arrival of a new Roman proconsul to Corinth would work in their favor. They hoped that Gallio would, would see what Paul was doing, would hear about what he was doing, and they would, they would view this new Christian sect that was rising up as illegal. They would outlaw it and punish Paul. In fact, these angry and unbelieving and blaspheming Jews broke the laws themselves by attacking Paul and, and forcing him to court before the Bema seat. There are processes and procedures in place uh, this was not the first time that Paul had to deal with fanatical, angry Jews dragging him before Roman courts, trying to prove that he had broken Roman law. We see it in Acts 16 and just the previous chapter in Acts 17. And as a citizen of Rome, Paul was prepared to defend himself. But he didn't have to. Because of the strange and the wonderful providences of God, Gallio here actually defends Paul. He tells the Jews that they have failed to interpret the matter correctly. They falsely believe it is a matter of Roman law, but Gallio refutes that and tells them that it's a matter of their interpretation of their own religion, saying he will not do anything in the matter. And the crowd, the, the Greeks, the Gentiles, were so angry, they took Sosthenes, just almost seemingly like a bystander at this moment, the leader of the synagogue who took over after Crispus was converted, and they beat him. And it's likely the Gentiles, even, uh, the Gentiles and even Gallio were more against the Jews than they were Paul. But look at this. If you'll go with me to 1 Corinthians 1, verse 1 and 2. When we look at these two verses, we find this. Verse 1, Paul called to be an apostle of Jesus Christ through the will of God and Sosthenes our brother unto the church of God which is in Corinth to them that are sanctified in Christ Jesus called to be saints with all that in every place call upon the name of Jesus Christ our Lord the mention of Sosthenes here is important now it's not told to us clearly if this is the same Sosthenes who was the leader of the synagogue but the reason he's mentioned in Scripture is because it would have been well known to the Christians and the Jews. This was an important name that Paul was, was mentioning. And it's speculated with good reason that this is the same Sosthenes who was just beaten by the Greeks, essentially taking the beating that was hopefully meant for Paul. They were meaning for Paul. But here, in 1 Corinthians, he's converted and now a brother in Christ. That's the transformative power 
of the gospel of Christ. When it meets wicked sinners and blasphemers in the places we can fear to go, and our dread and our discomfort and how we would rather not do something does not make a bit of difference to the command of Scripture to go and preach the gospel and make disciples of all nations. To put it, to put it as Pastor Hester put it in, I believe, last week's Sunday school lesson, your feelings don't matter. We travel the road of giving the gospel, knowing full well it could leave, uh, lead to a Bema seat situation in our own lives. And it may not look like Paul's, it may not be public, it may not be presided over by public officials, it just may come in the form of a comfy armchair across from the desk of your boss, or in the, the sneer and the mocking of family members at the truth of the gospel you presented them with. The example that, that Paul gives us here in Corinth is this. We do not close our eyes to the dangers or difficulties of the situations that we find in our own lives. We don't. Particularly in the places where we minister, we just simply look at those dangers through a divine perspective with eternal eyes. I know it's a simple message, but I believe it's a needed one for our evangelism goals and as a church body and as just individuals in 2022 and every day. If we examine our hearts, we may well find those places that keep us from moving forward to the call of our Savior in evangelism. And we must bring those anxieties to the foot of the cross and be encouraged by the Lord, as Paul was, to continue. Let's pray. Lord, we love you. Father, we desperately need you for every moment of our lives. God, I just I pray this year that as we intentionally turn and purpose our hearts on evangelism as a church, that it would change the way that we operate as a body. That it wouldn't be just this year-long endeavor, but that it would come to be a, a posture of who we are in you. Lord, give us boldness in our witness. Help us to rely on you in our weakness when we come to our emotions face to face with them, Lord. When we come to our fear, Father, would we choose you? Keep us from getting in our own way and help us to do what you've called us to do. It's in your name I ask these things. Amen. Well, what does success look like for you in giving the gospel? It is very easy for us to think success means the person accepts Christ. And that usually is not the case. Um, success means we spoke the truth in love for Christ. And I thank the Lord that he doesn't change. So the same God who served Paul and guided the very steps of Paul through the city of Corinth is the same God who guides our steps. And if God can deliver Paul and God can encourage Paul and God can uh, give faithful friends to Paul, then he, he certainly can do the same thing for us. So what are you doing with the gospel? How are you sharing it? Very simply, great, great challenge. I meant to write down a bunch of questions to ask you, and I got so enraptured in the message, I forgot to write it down. May that be our heart, though, that we desire for God to get the glory no matter what.